by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible, that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or capital of Israel, of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as Genesis 12 says, God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth, today on the 8th of June 2022, again in collaboration with my wonderful brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, all over the far big ocean from here, but connected with me via Skype, so that he is as clear to understand as he would sit right next to me. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the broadcast. The 93rd yeah. of the study of end-time delusions, what it started with, and exploding the Israel deception, what it has become in the end phase yeah. now. How are you doing? Yes, indeed. 93 sessions that we've done in this book, and every one of them worthy of the attention uh, we desire for them. And I don't think the listeners would be disappointed in any of them. And uh, again, my privilege, pleasure, and blessing to be here and to continue our reading and discussion of this book, ex destroying the, the Israel deception, exploding the Israel deception. Uh, this idea that uh, the modern nation state of Israel, created in 1948 by men, not by God, but by men, is, uh, is necessary for the credible fulfillment of a future phony 70th week of Daniel. That's what it's all about. The papacy intends to perform as best it can a believable uh, future 70th week of Daniel, understanding that the true and only 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus 2,000 years ago as perfectly and completely recorded in the New Testament. It's almost as if the New Testament was written for the very purpose of proving to all men for all time that Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled 
the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophetic vision, as recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 23, or 24 through 27. It's finished. And uh, the whole world believes a lie. And that lie, futurism, requires a modern nation state of Israel be created. And Jews forced down there to live in that land and to demand a temple to be rebuilt so that animal sacrifices can be made so that the phony Antichrist can cause those sacrifices and oblations to cease. Then the world is ready, then prepared to receive the papacy, the false Christ. And uh, we, I, I know it's getting old hat to the regular listeners, but it's necessary to repeat these essential parts so that people can understand, uh, people that are newly checking in, newly being acquainted with this, with this uh, discussion, to see how the world has been deceived. And uh, just about every evangelist that you can name is a futurist. Uh, there are a handful of expositors here on YouTube that are historicists, as I am and as Yerk is, but they're few and far between, and they get very little attention. But someday, someday, they'll have plenty of attention. Right, Yerk? Absolutely, Tom. And I think it is very interesting what you just said when you summed a little bit uh, the whole thing up. And, and not only the whole thing, quote-unquote thing, that's a stupid word to use here, but uh, uh, the whole uh, mission of Jesus Christ, actually. When he was on the cross, Jesus Christ said, it is done. Sure, Everything has been finished. fulfilled. Huh? It is yep. finished, he said. And Daniel's prophecy said to roll up the, the scroll. The point to is... To seal the vision and the prophecy. The point is, what is finished, Tom? That needs to be maybe explained to oh. the people. Because there are so many points that you can say that we're finished at the moment. But I think um, the most important point is that the salvation of mankind was finished. Right. That was his mission to come... Uh, okay. and, and perform his ministry in, in seven years right. uh, from, this, from the time that he was 30 on, that he, the, uh, that he was baptized. And when we go back to that time when he was baptized, Tom, um, the first thing after that happened, he went into the desert and yep. he was tempted by the devil. Yep. And the devil tried to make him bow down to him and worship him and therefore he would give him all the kingdoms of the world that mm -hmm. is recorded in matthew chapter 4 and that is recorded in luke chapter 4 mm -hmm. and i advise everybody to read that and understand that with the understanding that the papacy is the antichrist who took the offer that jesus christ rejected but more importantly as you just said then comes the moment yeah, when the Pope comes in, the Antichrist comes in as the savior of mankind, quote unquote, when they fulfill their phony 70th week of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the moment the devil was waiting for. That is exactly. when the whole world bows down to the Pope, which is a Antichrist, means a replacement of Christ. And behind that replacement of Christ, you find the devil himself. And That's the right. whole world bows down and worships the devil. And then okay. he finally got what he 2,000 years try ago tried to get from Jesus Christ. Yep, exactly. That's it. And uh, the Pope does indeed, despite everything anybody's ever been told, he is the king of this world. He rules the governments of this world. As difficult as that is to believe. Satan made good on his promise. Now, Christ rejected the offer, obviously, but uh, we, we, we are, we're ignorant to believe that Satan didn't offer this, this same offer to someone else. He offered it to the Antichrist, this, this papacy that calls itself the vicar of Christ, when in fact it's the vicar of Satan himself. Okay? And uh, even Martin Luther comprehended this. He said, the papacy is simply the mask behind which 
the the uh, uh, Satan rules. The mask behind which Satan resides. And uh, uh, he's the vicar of Satan, not the vicar of Christ, as he claims. He's, he's a liar. And uh, his, his father is the, is, is the author of lies. And uh, the papacy rules the world and is, is orchestrating this future 70th week of Daniel, which is nearly complete. All they have to do is build a temple and begin animal sacrifices. And then the Pope can flip a coin, decide who gets to, who gets to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease and take all the blame off of him for being the Antichrist. Because whoever causes those sacrifices and oblations to cease, everybody will believe positively identifiable that he is the Antichrist. You won't be able to convince anybody otherwise. And, uh, and, and so now all the onus is off of the papacy. You know, people like Inquisition Update, Tom Fress are supposed to go run and hide in a den. No, 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 no. I'll be on top of the mountain screaming my bloody head off. Now comes the real Antichrist riding into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass after this imposter Antichrist has been done away with. Now you're going to see the real Antichrist, the historical Antichrist, the one who's been the Antichrist for nearly 2,000 years. You're going to see him and, and everything, all the punishment, all the persecution, all the, all, all the naysayers, all the trouble that this ministry has caused me is all going to be worth it. It's all going to be repaid. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. I'm telling the truth, and I'm very, very confident in the truth that I'm telling. In history, in the future, in the near future, my name is going to be exonerated. I'm telling the truth, and so is Yerk. And uh, we're very confident in this truth. And uh, we won't be backing down, that's for certain. No, there's nowhere to back down to. I mean, no, there's nowhere to go. No. There's nowhere to go. No. Anyway, let's go back to the book. It's been some time since we've spent two broadcasts explaining to the people the real roots and foundation of um, Zionism. Now let's go back into 1948, An Unsinkable Doctrine, Chapter 8 of the book Exploding the Israel Deception by Steve Wolberg, where we deal with the subject that there are three main reasons now being used to support the theory that Bible prophecy was fulfilled in 1948. And the third argument that we are going to read today is the argument that uh, the author mentions here, the end time regathering argument. This is the quote-unquote big one. The idea is now being expressed all over the world that ancient prophecies found in the Old Testament, which predict a regathering of Israel back into their land, were fulfilled in 1948. The main prophecy used to support this conclusion is found in Ezekiel chapter 60, uh, 36 through 38. In the late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsay gives the following three reasons why Ezekiel's prophecy must point to a 1948 fulfillment. First, God said concerning Israel in Ezekiel 36:24, quote, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. The phrase out of all countries applies to a worldwide dispersion, and therefore cannot apply to the time of the Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel's prophecy will be fulfilled in the latter days, as we can read in Ezekiel 38, verse 16, where the Bible says, quote, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land, and it shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Which, according to Herr Lindsay, is a definite term, 
applying to the time just preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ. These three reasons have been accepted by countless, and I add quote unquote, Christians as unsinkable evidence in favor of a 1948 fulfillment. And I add the quote unquote Christians because they think they are Christians, but they are not. If they were Christians, they would study the Bible and not listening to a Jesuit educated pastor or priest behind a pulpit in a building that has a steeple, which is nothing else but an obelisk, a sexual symbol of Babylon. The following five arguments not only cast doubt upon the three points just listed, but also prove that the Bible prophecy could not have been fulfilled in 1948. So, there were three points made why this was in the Old Testament written for the end times to legitimatize the 1948 state of Israel. And now, five arguments why that could not have been. And you have to judge for yourself. You have to study this for yourself. I cannot do that for you. Steve Wolber cannot do that for you. Tom cannot do that for you. If you are lacking the interest of studying yourself, the Bible, the Word of God, and get an own complete understanding, these helping tools are worthless for you. These are helping tools. The five points now the author mentions and the comments that I added to this and the comments that Tom adds to our reading here only make sense if you are willing to study this for yourself. And let me assure you, and I think Tom will uh, praise me for when I say that, that only the truth that you find out for yourself is also the truth that you can live with, that you can accept, that you can accept as having been given by the Holy Spirit by studying the Word. As it is written in the Bible that faith comes through hearing and hearing comes through the Word of God and the Word of God is in the Bible. And if you do not study the Bible, you do not learn the Word of God. It is absolutely important that you take these broadcasts that Tom and I are doing as a basis for your own study and then being led by the Holy Spirit reading the correct, the 1611 King James Bible and coming to the same conclusions as we do, then you are convinced that it is true because you came to these conclusions. Isn't that right, Tom? Yes, that's absolutely right. And what Yerk is trying to tell you is, is the same wisdom used by many fathers to their sons. The son comes to the father and says, Dad, I need a car. I want a car. Dad, please buy me a car. And the old man says, Son, get a job, earn the money, and buy your own car. Then you'll take care of it. Isn't that true? Sure, that's true. You buy the son a car, he, it's easy come, easy go. And history proves that a son will take much better care of a car that he had to work to earn rather than a gift that's given. All right, same thing with the truth in the Bible. If you work for it, you own it, and you keep it. Okay, it becomes yours. And uh, haven't we had enough being spoon fed by the by the priesters and the pastors and the priests? Haven't we been spoon fed quite enough poison? I think we should feed ourselves for a change out of the Bible itself and out of history and come to the truth rather than the the poison potion that's called futurism that we've all devoured and now has become our great hope. And uh, uh, I've, I've learned the lesson the hard way. I, I decided long ago, 20 years ago, 
to get the truth myself out of the scriptures. That way I can stand behind it. I can defend it as if it were mine, because it is mine. I own it. I work for it. And I'm not going to give it away and believe some liar. I've been deceived all my life. I've been made a fool of all my life by futurist pastors of many different denominations. They all tell the same lie. And uh, I know better now. I've apologized on my face in sackcloth and ashes to the Lord. And I'll not go back to that old mistake. Read the scriptures for yourself. Find the truth yourself. Do it alone. Uh, the truth makes good company. You don't need to be standing in a crowd when all the crowd lies to you. Better to be alone with the truth than to be popular and accepted in a world of liars. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, Tom, I think that is what separates the men from the babies. And that is a, a very important point because um, do you want to drink milk all your life or do you want to eat meat? And to eat meat, you have to have a stomach that can work on that. And that stomach you have to train. And training is the reading of the word of God. If you want to become a Christian without, quote, uh, Christian, unquote, then do your own studies and own it, as Tom says, and make it your own. Absolutely. But therefore, uh, last point before we continue, you need to have a true Bible. You need to have the 1611 King James Bible in English to do that. So, point number one of five arguments. God specifically told ancient Israel that he would gather them from all the nations immediately after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon. We read that in Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 10, 14 and 18. And here is all verses between 10 and uh, 20 I covered in here. So, what did God say? He specifically told ancient Israel that he would gather them from all the nations immediately after the 70 years be accomplished. How did he say that? For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Because ye have said, The Lord hath raised up us prophets in Babylon. Know that thus saith the Lord of the king that sitteth upon the throne of David, and of all the people that dwelleth in the city, and of your brethren, that are not gone forth with you into captivity. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and I will make them like vile figs that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. And I will persecute them with the sword, with the famine, and with the pestilence, and I will deliver them to be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, and an astonishment, and an hissing, and a reproach among all the nations, whither I have driven them, because they have not hearkened to my words, saith the Lord, which I sent unto them by my servants the prophets, rising up early and sending them, but ye would not hear, saith the Lord. Hear ye therefore the word of the Lord, all ye of the captivity whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. 
Now, I think this is a very profound text. And there's a very profound part in it. And that uh, alone, to me, tells me why the 1948 founded nation state of Israel cannot be the biblical one. Verse 13 of Jeremiah 29 says, And ye shall seek me, and find me, and when ye shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations. The point is, and ye shall seek me and find me. And he says in verse 12 even, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Do you see the quote-unquote Jews, the inhabitants of the land of Israel that was founded in 1948, call upon the God of the Bible? Do you see them go and pray to the God of the Bible? Do you see them seeking Elohim? Finding Elohim? Those are questions that you have to ask. How can these verses be used to sustain a fulfillment of Bible prophecy when in no way, shape or form any of that what I just ask is to be found in the nation state of Israel today? Any thoughts there, Tom? Absolutely, I have some thoughts about this. Well, please. I want to I ask the listeners if... Uh, the Jews were seeking with all their heart the Lord to be reestablished in their ancient homeland. Then why was it necessary? Why was it necessary for World War I and World War II to be used to persecute the Jews beyond their ability to, 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 to comprehend? Why was World War I and World War II, why was the Holocaust necessary? If, if the Jews were seeking with all their heart the Lord God, with the hope of being restored to their land by a divine deliverance, why was it necessary to have World War I and World War II? Why was it necessary to persecute the Jews beyond their ability to uh, sustain to put the fear of God in every Jew. That's what they did. That's what it took. Not to gather all the Jews from all the nations, but to expel the Jews from all the nations through persecution. You know this cannot be talking about this biblical fulfillment and restoration of the Jews to their holy land, to their homeland. What we've witnessed since 1917 is a man-made restoration of the Jews, not a God-made restoration of the Jews. What we saw in 1948 was not the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It was the fulfillment of the decree of the futurists, the Zionists, in the Vatican, hoping against hope to make the Pope be accepted in the world as the Christ in a future phony reenactment of the 70th week of Daniel, which requires a modern nation state of Israel, Jews living in the land, a temple rebuilt, and animal sacrifices instituted. Do you comprehend it now? Yes, God has a plan for the Jews who have been temporarily blinded for our benefit so that salvation can come to the Gentiles. But we, our commission, according to the Apostle Paul and the Prophet Paul, he was both an apostle and a prophet, he said our commission was to provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Messiah. To what end? 
that they would seek the Lord God with all their heart. And so that God could call them and deliver them back to their homeland. And let me tell you, when that day occurs, there isn't a nation on this earth that dare lift a finger against a Jew. Just like Pharaoh in Egypt, who sought to follow them to the Red Sea and destroy them on the beach, God delivered the Israelites. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. And when the Egyptian army tried to follow them through, God let the waves and the, and the walls of water crash in on them and drown them all. That's what's going to happen to the Gentile nations once the Jews seek God with all their heart. And God decides, God decides to deliver his people Israel. The Gentiles better not lay a hand on any of them. Never touch a hair of their head or they will reap the wrath of Almighty God just like Pharaoh's army did. Now, has any of that happened? Now, what makes more sense? The historicist understanding of Daniel's prophecy or the Pope's future interpretation? of Daniel's prophecy. What makes more sense? The, the, the pipe dream called futurism or the historical reality? I don't think there's a question about it. The whole world is prepared to believe a lie. It's already believing the lie. It's already bit the bait, hook, line, and sinker. You can't find an evangelist. You can't find a pastor. You can't find a priester anywhere in the world that'll stand before the cameras and say, the 70th week of Daniel is over. Jesus fulfilled it 2,000 years ago. Why are you expecting a future fulfillment? Why do you expect the Jews to have to be driven by persecution and inquisition and holocaust back down to their ancient homeland when God plainly says, if you seek me with all my heart, I will gather you out of all the nations and essentially deliver them back to their homeland just like he did the ancient uh, captives of, uh, of Egypt. A miraculous, visible deliverance of God's people. I know what I believe. It's too easy. You can't get it wrong. 1948 is a lie. The, the modern nation state of Israel as it exists today, God had nothing to do with. Man forced the Jews down there so that they could fulfill a phony future 70th week of Daniel to deceive the whole world. And everyone is deceived. The whole world is deceived. I was deceived, but Yerk just read you passages from the scripture that make what literally happened in history fail the test of scripture, and thereby you know this was not God's deliverance of his people out of all the nations and to bring them back down to their land. The Jews were not seeking after God. They wanted to assimilate themselves within the nations where they dwelt. They were not looking for a miraculous delivery back into ancient Israel. They were, they were content to just live among the Gentiles. And why? Because that's where God wants them. Because it's the Gentiles' commission. Bible-believing Christians who believe and do what Paul said provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Messiah. Then they will seek the Lord God with all their heart, and God will deliver them, and he will save them. Isn't that what we want for the Jews? Paul said, I'd give up my own salvation for the salvation of my Jewish brethren. 
But no, Christianity, as we've called it for nearly 2,000 years, has done nothing but kill and persecute and defame, defrock, and destroy the Jews. Oh, we so love Israel, they love to say. We're gathering up all this money so that the Jews can build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again so they can eat and drink damnation to themselves. Is that the kind of Christian you want to be? It's time for a little sanity to come to the church. It's time for God's people to separate themselves, sanctify themselves, come out of the churches, be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean futurist thing, and I will receive you. And then we can help the Jews. But you certainly can't help them by staying in the churches and making collections to help finance a Jewish return to an Israel that was created by man in 1948 so that the Jews can build a temple and begin the animal sacrifices again so that they can eat and drink damnation to themselves just like the Roman Catholics do every day. Where is the sanity in that? Where is the truth in that? Where is the Christian agenda in any of that back to you york yeah thank you very very much tom for your very important elaboration of the subject now point two of five that steve Wahlberg wants to discuss with us it says the time period right after the babylonian captivity is also called the latter days therefore we read jeremiah 29 10 to 14 as we already did 30 24 where it says the fierce anger of the lord shall not return until ye have done it and until he have performed the intents of his heart in the latter days ye shall consider it also jeremiah 27 2 uh, verse 2 th through 7 <laughs> In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josea, king of Judah, came this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus saith the Lord to me, Make thee bonds and yokes, and put them upon thy neck, and send them to the king of Edom, and to the king of Moab, and to the king of the Ammonites, and to the king of Tyrus, and to the king of Zidon, by the hand of the messengers which come to Jerusalem unto Zedekiah, king of Judah and command them to say into them, unto their masters, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus shall ye say unto your masters, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it unto whom it seemed me meet unto me. And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. And all nations shall serve him and his son, and his son's son, until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. Interesting, eh, Tom, that God here already speaks of the destruction of Babylon. Yep. All nations shall serve him and his son and the son's son until the very time of his land come. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Part. God speak, if God speaks it, it comes to pass. Yeah. Chapter 48 in Jeremiah, verse 47, we read, Yet will I bring again the captivity of Moab into the, latter, into the later days, says the Lord. Thus far is the judgment of Moab. And in chapter 49, verse 39, we read, quote, But it shall come to pass in the latter days that I will bring again the captivity of Elam, saith the Lord. And finally, in chapter 50, verse 1, we read, The word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Thus, 
the phrase letter or later days is not always a definite term that applies to the time just preceding the second coming of Jesus. Moses told ancient Israel, I know that after my death evil will befall you in the latter days. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 29. We read, For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And you have to know that Tom and I were speaking about reading Deuteronomy chapter 31, and maybe even chapter 30, the one preceding chapter 31 in the fifth or last book of Moses because with that you will have a, a better understanding of how the Bible tells you things that will come later on. When Moses speaks here of, I know that after my death evil will befall you in the latter days, he doesn't speak of the end time just before Jesus Christ returns for the second time. I think it is quite clear to everybody that has two working brain cells that this is about when they enter the land that then the evil will befall them in the latter days and they will again fall away from the belief as they did already during the 40 years they wandered in the desert. Isn't that the reason why they wandered in the desert for 40 years? Because the people who fled out of Egypt fell into unbelief? Didn't they pray to a golden calf that was made when um, Moses went up the hill and didn't come down right again and they said, oh, this Moses, we, we what not where, he's, where he went to, we what not if he comes back, uh, make us a golden calf and this is the God that led us out of the bondage of Israel. Isn't that what the Bible says? Isn't it then normal prophetic talk, talk that Moses told ancient Israel, I know that after my death evil will befall you again, I add? in the latter days, in the days to come? Well, to me, this is um, quite sure that with the latter days, it is not always meant the days right before Jesus Christ's second coming. Because here, even when Moses wrote this in Deuteronomy, Jesus hadn't come the first time. So it could also be speaking of the time after the Babylonian captivity. Yeah, maybe. But the Jews, Israel, more correct, the whole people of Israel have numerous times fallen away from the true worship of the true God, haven't they? Isn't that what we read in the book of Joshua, in the book of Judges, in Samuel, the first book, in Samuel, the second book? Just remember... Um, the son of David, Absalom, I think was his name. I just read about this weekend in, in my car when I read the Bible. He also fell away. He made himself a steel, a what we call today an obelisk of what God says, don't do it. And he made that of, of himself. Read it again. Samuel, the second book, uh, second Samuel, that is. Wonderful book. The rise of King David. Wonderful stories. And you can see how what Moses said here in his last book, Deuteronomy, happened again and again and again after the death of Moses. Some additional thoughts to that, Tom? Certainly. I have a modern day equivalent to this. You know, it isn't the Jews who just are the only ones who fell away. Uh, we, we have the equivalent of our own Moses in the Protestant reformers who led, led us out of Babylonian captivity in the Roman Catholic Church. We once knew, and the Protestant reformers told us who the Antichrist was, that it was the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the beast, the Judas priest, was the papacy, is, was, and always will be the papacy. 
We once knew all these things. Now look who's fallen away. You can't find anybody on the street that knows who the Antichrist is. If you ask a thousand people who is the Antichrist, you'll get a thousand different answers. The fact of the matter is nobody today knows who the Antichrist is. But they all know who the Antichrist was during the time of the Protestant Reformation, just just 500 and what, three, four years ago? They all knew. You ask anybody on the street, who's the Antichrist? Well, they could tell you at least the Protestant reformers believe that it's the papacy who reigns over the kings of the earth. I they knew 500 you. years ago what we all ought to know today. Yes, Jörg? Yeah, I, I can tell a little anecdote. Is that the right word that you say, anecdote? A little, sure. Uh, yeah, a little anecdote about what this false teaching does to man. Um, everybody knows by now that I haven't been a Christian all my life. Uh, God found me just some 10 years ago, and ever since I'm working for the Lord, and uh, I, I don't like to do anything else, actually. This is just what I love to do. But when I was younger, I watched a movie that you probably all know. Uh, I think that even Tom knows. Um, it is called The Omen. Have you heard of that, Tom? I, I've heard of it, but I've never watched it. Yeah, the Omen was a movie, I think, from the beginning of the 1970s, and I watched it probably somewhere in the end of the 70s because I was too young when it came out. I was born in 66. Um, there was a movie with Gregory Peck, and it was, a, I think, a three-part movie, and it, it dealt about the Antichrist. It dealt about, about a person that was born into a political power, and that um, actually was Satan on earth. Um, and it started off as a child. I think one of the parts even was called Damien. Yeah? It's, uh, of course, a derivative of the word demon in there. Um, the Bible never speaks of demons. The Bible only speaks of devils, but that's uh, another case. But when I watched this movie and I saw this devilish child and I saw what he did to all the, the enemies to, ra to raise to the power that he got into in the end, I was not a believer at those times. I said, oh my God, I am afraid of when this Antichrist comes. And I didn't even have an idea who Jesus Christ was because I wasn't a believer. But that's how that movie worked on me. Now, can you imagine how this movie works on people who know who Christ is, but have no idea who the Antichrist is, and seeing movies like this, and seeing movies like this whole end-time delusion stuff that we were talking about, broadcast and broadcasts ago, with all this left behind, and this one Mr. Bad Guy in the end coming? Can you imagine what does that what that does to people who really believe in Jesus Christ and then all of a sudden are faced with stories like that. I remember even still today, 56 years old almost, how I shivered at that time from those stories. And that's exactly what the priests covered on when they are on their pulpits and preach the coming future Antichrist from the pulpits to the people that sit there in anguish. Sorry, Tom, I really needed these five minutes to speak about this movie, The Omen. Uh, I, 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 I can look if I have a picture of it even. But um, that, that really spoke heard, to me. And, and, and I've heard you speak about it before, but I never watched it, so I can't yeah. relate to it. But, uh, this is this is the uh, from uh, Jerry Goldsmith is the music and uh, it's uh, Gregory Peck I don't know this woman and then of course you see here the child and the shadow is this wolf uh, and this is the part omen the omen too well that child doesn't have a godly look does it huh? his day will come six plus six plus oh six. Yeah, uh, it, it was it was three parts. Yeah, maybe you you heard of it, maybe you haven't heard of it. It's just uh, uh, Gregory Peck, Lee Remick, 
uh, the omen. I think that was from somewhere in the beginning of the 1970s. And that really, really, you have been warned. Eh? If something frightens, frightening happens to you today, think about it. It may be the omen. Yeah, so my point is just that freaked me out when I was a child and I wasn't even a believer. So I can understand or can imagine what, what that does to people who believe, actually. And what are we doing with these readings here? We're giving the people the insurance that God loves them and that God tells them what's really going on. You don't have to rely on some shady movie or shady teacher or preacher on your pulpit. You have to just believe the Bible, the Word of God, where he tells you in very clear terms who is the Christ and who is the Antichrist. And then you are made free with the knowledge and the wisdom that Jesus gives you. Not that the world gives you, but with the peace that Jesus gives you. And all of a sudden, everything else just doesn't matter anymore. Back to you, Tom. Well, the reason most people today can't conceive the papacy as being the literal antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy is because they can't conceive that the papacy has as much political power as is necessary to rule over the kings of the earth. Oh, but that's easily what? refuted if they, oh, that, that yes, really doesn't indeed, have the power. Oh, yes, indeed it is. Because you, you just have to look at the concordats. And a concordat is a binding contract between two nations, in this case the Vatican and the other country that does the concordat with the Vatican, to give the Roman Catholic Church the absolute power that is needed to reign. And for the day there are more than 179 concordats all over the world. Does the Pope really rule the world? <laughs> yeah, sorry Tom, I had to add this. Well, uh, and even even that, uh, uh, my reading and discussion of the book, the Vatican, or uh, rather, uh, uh, by Francis Rooney, the Knight of Malta, he wrote a book. Uh, global uh, Vatican. Uh, uh, yeah, the Global Vatican. And, and that is uh, written by a Knight of Malta who served under President George H., or rather, George W. Bush, who was made uh, a, a papal... Uh, representative to the Vatican, the, the the ambassador to the Holy See for the United States of America. And he lays it out how much power the Vatican really wields both for the foreign and domestic uh, 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 policies for the United States of America. Now, look, uh, if people read that book and comprehend what it literally says, there'd be civil war by morning. We would be against the government allowing the Pope to be the king of the United States of America. The United States of America is not to have a king. Right? Then why is the Pope the king of the United States of America? And if you don't believe it, just list, just read the book. The, uh, 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 the, the Global Vatican by Francis Rooney, or better yet, listen to my verbatim reading and discussion of that book, and you will hear with your own ears what Francis Rooney reveals. The power, the political, economic, uh, domestic, foreign policy for the United States of America is determined by the Vatican. And uh, uh, you will rue the day that President, jo uh, President Ronald Reagan ever reestablished formal diplomatic relations between the United States and the Vatican. It once had it until it realized that the Vatican was responsible for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and we cut all ties with the Vatican. And it was Ronald Reagan that reestablished those ties. And uh, you, you've got to ask yourself, why in the world does the government of the United States of America exchange diplomatic uh, ambassadorships with the Vatican? Why do we have a constant two-way communication with the Vatican? What is that all about? 
Why is our government consulting the Vatican about anything? And especially in light of the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation informed the whole world that the Vatican, the papacy, is, was, and always will be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the Judas priest, the antichrist of scripture, history, and prophecy. That was the hue and cry of the Protestant Reformation. No one was left ignorant of what the papacy really represented in the world. Everyone knew. How is it that the United States of America, which began as a Protestant nation, as a matter of fact, the only Protestant Reformation in the earth, has now exchanged diplomatic uh, ambassadors with the Vatican? A nation that says we will have no king to rule over us? The people will rule. There will be a rule of law established of, by, and for the people. Well, that's not the case. And to ch- I just I just watch people's eyes roll in their heads when they when they hear me say that the Vatican has this much power in the United States. And I'm telling you, it does have this much power. And if it has that much power in the United States of America, how much power do you think it has in Great Britain? How much power do you think it has in Germany? Belgium, Spain, Portugal, France, the South America, Canada, the whole world. The Bible, which I believe says he, meaning the Antichrist, reigneth over the kings of the earth. Actually, it says that city, that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth, is speaking of none other than Vatican City. Francis Rooney confirmed it in his book. You can't get it wrong. The Protestant reformers concur, as do all the saints throughout history. And what the Protestant Reformation led to was the people standing up and say to their kings of of their nations, you will no longer serve the papacy. You will no longer rule and reign over us in 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 the name of the papacy, the Antichrist. You will either convert to Protestantism or we're going to throw you out. And, the, and all of Europe erupted into war. They made Europe, at least northern Europe, for the most part, Protestant. They protested the Antichrist of Rome. Or is anybody in our Christian world appraised a, a or apprised? of that European history, the Protestant Reformation history. And once you realize that the papacy has always been the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy, if anybody ever told you that the 70th week of Daniel was yet future, you'd laugh them to scorn. You mean we won't know who the Antichrist is until he causes the sacrifices and oblations to to cease in a rebuilt temple sometime after the year 2022, they would laugh you to scorn. And you know what else they'd tell you? Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. What are you smoking? Now you know how deceived we are? What have you been smoking? Futurism! It's a stench in the nostrils of Almighty God. And it's our damnation. It's our, it's our downfall. We once knew the truth. Our Moseses, our Protestant reformers, told us the truth. And here we are only 500 years later, and all of us are completely ignorant about what they taught. Nobody knows who the Antichrist is. Everybody thinks the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, which is the same thing as saying Jesus was not the fulfillment of it. Therefore, Jesus could not be the Messiah. Do you realize if you believe in futurism, you've denied the Christ that bought you? You deny that he's the son of the all, the the, the only begotten son of God who said on the cross about your, your redemption, it is finished? In the midst of the week, 
He said, it is finished. And when he redeemed you with his own precious blood, he put a permanent end to sacrifices and oblations. Once the supreme sacrifice had been given, the lamb that God provided, how dare you make another sacrifice, whether you be Jew or Gentile. But you know, all the churches today are preparing their congregations little by little to accept the mass of the Roman Catholic Church, which is outright a sacrifice. They call it the Eucharist. It is a sacrifice. Now do you see the falling away that took place right after the demise of our Moses, our Protestant reformers? We commit the same sins of Israel, yet we all think ourselves to be pious Christians. Well, we all ought to be on our faces in sackcloth and ashes. Literally. Back.